we are starting a public dialogue in Tucson, Pima County in general about what most people refer to as 5G, fifth generation wireless and the Internet of Things. Technology is evolving and as it does, is it is tr transforming society and us and the way we communicate. So we're here to look into Pandora's box, and see what's in there, what the implications are, what are the risks, what are the benefits, and do, are there any alternative options to fifth generation wireless? The second slide is just illustrating what fourth generation antennas look like around town and what fifth generation antenna infrastructure that is will look like when it is in town. But these are going in all over the country and we are hearing stories of people who are waking up to find them in their front yards and are going to speak with their public officials about it, uh, asking for relief. Uh, it's coming as a kind of a surprise and I'll tell you why in a minute. But the, the tower on the left uh, is well known to all of us. These are saguaro cacti icons of our area and they're also homes for cellular antennas. But those are third and fourth G generation antennas. The, the one, the box that the photo down at the bottom is a 5G antenna, not taken from here, but it shows what they look like up close. They're a, a, a small square box, kind of the size of a large handbag. And they're often posted on s s poles by themselves or on power poles. And then on the right is a, a, a conceptual framework or design for what the infrastructure will look like uh, focusing on the beam forming capability of 5G. Fifth generation wireless has a completely different type of signaling system. Different frequencies, different power levels, and has capabilities that the earlier generations did not have. And one of them is beam forming to a smart car, a smart phone, a smart office, smart home, and it can transmit almost instantaneously because built into that beam are a lot of antennas and built into the receptors in the homes and phones and cars and offices are several antennas. So this is the reason why they can claim uh, that everything's going to be a lot faster because they are building a system that will transmit a lot of data very quickly. So that beam is going to be used to almost instantaneously transmit a whole lot of data. So those of you who like to do video downloads, if you're a customer, you'll be receiving signal, uh, your video for the evening right away. But don't get between that beam and the antenna and where it's going, okay, because it could be harmful. Next slide, please. Speed and connectivity will increase due to antenna densification around town. This is the plan. They intend to uh, install roughly a million more antennas in the United States for fifth generation wi wireless. There are now about 250,000 towers that have, some have multiple antennas. So what are going up now will be a million more towers that will have one or more antennas. These are not individual antennas necessarily. 5G homes will, phones will be on the market by next summer. And the telecom industry plans to be in charge of a national 5G infrastructure that may look like this. This is another schematic. I won't go into all the details, but in the back left, you see a very, very tall tower called a macro cell, and it contains a whole lot of antennas, and it's called multiple input, multiple output. That, that large tower is capable of beaming a lot of data directly to particular sources on demand. Um, and it will connect with fixed wireless antennas on buildings and then connect to small cell antennas nearby the buildings, very close in some cases, and it can connect to the smart cars and the smartphones. And, uh, so this is what it would look like. It would also be connecting along the street. Literally everything will be connected um, if this plan goes through. Down in the far right corner is a little black box with the word fiber over it. The fiber means that this little black box is the link to the fiber wired backhaul that the wireless industry still uses to support their wireless infrastructures. We'll be hearing later from Dr. Tim Sheckley about the benefits of municipal fiber optic networks to the premises. This is really an alternative option. Using that fiber, and we have about 500 miles of fiber underneath the ground in this town, 
building on that fiber and perhaps envisioning something else than totally 5G wireless everywhere. Um, instead, we would have a fiber optic system to the premises. This is, uh, very quickly, I'm gonna show you the, the vision that the designers of the Internet of Things would like us to know about for the future. I said earlier, everything will be connected to everything. The designers of this conceptual framework envision sensors and tra many trans microtransmitters that are attached to uh, literally everything we can see in our lives that we do, objects all over the place, like plant water, uh, drugs, our shoes, food, um, all kinds of appliances, you name it. Uh, as this builds out, that is, that's the end game. That's in what, is, what is being envisioned. So the, I got this out of one of the na federal national reports that, that uh, describes, describes the, the plan, the vision for this uh, cyber physical framework that uh, the National Institute of Science and Technology has come up with. I want to read a quote here from Dr. Anthony Chan, who's the CEO of Huawei uh, Technologies. They have a plant in Texas. It's a Chinese company based in the United States, and they manufacture cell phones. And uh, it was overheard ta talking at a conference a, a year or so ago where he indicated really what the driver is for the, the manufacturers of cell phones. And he said, if the technology does not change, the company will die. It is more about jobs, engineering, and manufacturing. People need to buy a new cell phone. The chief concerns that citizens have about fifth generation are the following. Real property devaluation. How would you feel if you suddenly woke up one day and there was a lull tower up to 50 feet tall in your front yard in the right of way access, the utility access, and you were told that uh, they didn't have to tell you about it, and it's there, and it's not going to come down. And you know that there's an antenna on top of that tower that's going to be radiating into your home. Now, clearly, if you're a customer, you want wireless services for telephone, internet, and television, this is great. But for some people, it may be cause for great concern. So it's a kind of a double-edged sword here. Some people may then want to shield their home. Uh, Eric Windheim is here today as a building biologist, and he'll be describing what people can do if they're concerned about shielding themselves and what their personal practices might be should they be, find themselves being exposed to fifth-generation wireless. The threats to health and well-being. The threats to health are well-established, but it's been very difficult to get the point across with our federal agencies, the FCC, the Congress. We have been... I have been working with people for over two decades to bring the health concerns that people have, which are science-based, to decision makers to repeal Section 704 of the Federal Telecommunications Act, which was passed in 1996 and prohibited states from denying a permit for cytosol antenna based on health concerns. That's what drew me into this issue in the first place. I thought, what? Why would they do that? What's the point? What are they hiding? Well, we're still in that position, looking at this issue, saying, what is going on? So that preemption is already there. And then on top of them, we're going to have some more preemptions that the FCC just placed into federal law just very recently. Well, to continue about citizens' concerns, they're, threat they're concerned about their public safety. Where are these uh, antennas going to go? Where is the equipment case box going to go? Is it going to be in an area where people are gardening or their children play? Are they gonna fall over it? Is that gonna fall? Is it gonna hit, hurt, hit my building? Are they gonna have to cut down trees? We don't know. Loss of privacy, another huge issue, which I'm not gonna go into today, today, but if you have paid attention to what's going on with Google and Facebook, you're getting a hint about all the unresolved privacy issues that we're facing as citizens in this country that are not being adequated, adequately addressed for our protection. Threats to security, even national security. There again, wireless systems are easy to hack into. They are being hacked into. We know it, and yet we don't seem to be able to get on top of it. Finally, there was a law in Arizona that passed um, in, in April 2017 that is, was, was a model legislation proposed by ALEC. ALEC is the 
uh, American Legislative Exchange Commission, I believe it's called, and they write model laws. It's a conservative group. Arizona was the first state to pass that law, and it welcomes accelerated fifth five generation wireless into Arizona. Only 20 states have done this. And that law provides that there would be no zoning review or approval needed for a 5G antenna, so just so long it was co-located site and the tower was not taller than 50 feet. The National Toxicology Program just completed a report that was requested by the Food and Drug Administration in 1999. At that time, FDA said, you know, there's 80 million people in the U.S. using a cell phone. Is this a safe technology? So NTP undertook a very large animal study. It cost about $25 million. But it was really strange that the study took so many years to complete. Now, I wonder why that happened. Uh, so here we are today, we finally have the final report, and guess what? It reports there's clear evidence of cancer, heart cancer, uh, some evidence of geoblastoma, these are, and uh, some have adrenal cancer, and a whole lot of questions about other cancers plus hyperplasias that could later on become cancers. So there's a lot of evidence here. This was a long-term study of rats, and for sure, rats should not use a cell phone. We know that for sure. But... <laughs> What we don't know is, how about people? How does this affect human health? So the next step, which is usually taken, is the Food and Drug Administration does a health assessment of a report like that. That's what they always do when the NTP does animal studies. And they make a determination about the human health effects, the likelihood there's a harm, and then issue, issue health advisories. Well, strangely enough, that's not happening right now. But when you consider that that FDA is a captured agency, it's understandable. Uh, this is, means that we're not being protected. We're already not being protected because the FCC human exposure guidelines for radio frequency radiation are obsolete, they're based on old science, they're inadequate, they only protect us against short-term exposure, not chronic exposure, one frequency at a time, not all the frequencies we're being exposed to, and finally, they're only protecting us against thermal heat or burn, whereby we might go into shock or have a burn on our bodies. It's entirely different than the exposure conditions we are receiving from these low ubiquitous frequencies that are permeating our lives every day. So it's an experiment, a massive human experiment, and we're the subjects of it. And we can't look to our government to look after us on this. When asked about this report, FDA said, well, we don't think there's a problem. You know, we're not really jump. They didn't seem anxious to look into it very deeply. But when you consider that the peer reviewers of this study, even the man who designed this study, Dr. Ron Melnick, who's now retired, said, this is the time now where you need to take a look and refer the matter to the International Agency on Research on Cancer to do a review of the science because there are confirming studies based on epidemiology, human epidemiology studies, and other animal studies that confirm this study. So there's a lot of evidence that would justify raising the level from a possible to a probable human carcinogen. When IARC did that on glyphosate about eight months ago, things happened. You all may know that. Things happened. Monsanto went out of business. They let themselves be bought up by, by, by Bayer. So um, things need to happen. Office of Naval Research, they produced a chart showing what the symptoms are for people who have microwave sickness or electrical hypersensitivity. And the symptoms are all listed there in terms of parts of the body, the brain, the eyes, the heart, the lungs, the skin, etc. The print's too small for you to read all of that, but the point is this report came out in 1971 by the U.S. Navy. Why are we not paying attention to that? Because more and more people are experiencing these effects. I direct a uh, appeal to the United Nations on this, signed by scientists who have published on electromagnetic fields and have found effects below the uh, current standards set by the FCC and international agencies. 244 scientists who have published in this field in 41 nations have signed this appeal and it's made its way all over the world. It's a very credible statement about the state of the science. And we have yet to get an answer back from the World Health Organization, the UN Environment Program, or the, the head of the UN. 
to whom we addressed it. This is the electromagnetic spectrum. So non-ionizing radiation, which is the portion of the spectrum we're talking about, has not been considered hazardous by, by and large. And until about eight decades ago, when a lot of research started coming out of Eastern Europe, and then with the military, and then certain occupations were studied. And so we, here we are today, where there have been a massive amount of studies over decades pointing towards harm, with no intervention to lower the threshold. What's involved is information is being transmitted to all the cells of our body, and our body is responding to the signal that way. Information to the cell. Finally, why use multi millimeter wave radiation for 5G wireless? Well, it seems to work just fine for the military. They use it for weaponry and surveillance at very high powers. So they're taking that technology and they're gonna now distribute it commercially at lower power. So we don't know whether lower power makes a difference, yes or no, in terms of effects, uh, adverse effects. But we do know that there's a history of this technology being used for weaponry and surveillance. It raises a lot of questions. The signals are very short. They're like just a matter of inches or less. So they're in the same range as an insect or a, a, fet a fetus, a developing fetus, and therefore can be much more harmful. And we are losing our insect population around the world already. Uh, so it's, it's cause for concern because this kind of blunt signal, which is going to be piercing the walls of our buildings, capable of s causing serious harm, then where do we go? People who are sensitive to this may be having trouble finding an alternative place where they feel safe to live. 